can you keep things cool without a refrigerator? Well, there is a very simple way and it's not a new technological idea. Welcome to the latest edition of Eco Africa. I am Sandra Twinobrio coming to you from Kampala here in Uganda. Hello Sandra again, Eco Africa highlights good examples from one country that can work in other African countries and we offer some environmental help I'm Chris Alems from Abelkuta, Nigeria. Here are some of the things we have lined up for you. In Burkina Faso, a group of farmers who now exchange the latest information via old-fashioned radios. How old wind turbines are recycled in Poland and what can be made out of them. And a simple way to keep goods cool for as long as possible without electricity in Malawi. But we first head to Egypt, who will host the next COP climate conference in 2022. The country on the Nile with its deserts, long coastline and megacity Cairo is extremely vulnerable to the effect of climate change. Now leaders want to increase public investment in climate friendly measures by 50% by 2025. This does not only apply to major initiatives, but small-scale grassroots ones too. A tiny non-profit outside the capital is among those seeking to bring change to ordinary community life. Habiba is helping out, and so is Ahmed, children from the Egyptian village of Esbert Ishak excited about this small new playground that's been built with recycled materials. It's to be really colorful. Neighbors and other villagers are making sure of that. The project was initiated by an Egyptian NGO called Bina. The organization promotes sustainable projects and particularly focuses on children and young people. Children in rural areas often lack playgrounds. With each project, we are creating open spaces for them, and we make these spaces with recycled materials, such as old wood and car tires. But this playground is also linked to a new school building where children with learning difficulties or those who have stopped going to school can receive extra help to get them back into school. The village of Esbert Ishak is about a two-hour journey southwest from Cairo. The area has one of the highest rates of illiteracy in the country. The nearest school is a two-kilometer walk away on a road with lots of traffic. We built the classroom for young children. It's much closer so they won't have to walk on the busy road. Now the village has the only school of its kind in all of Egypt that's made with recycled materials. It was built from compacted earth and 9,000 plastic bottles filled with sand. Plastic waste is a huge problem in Egypt. The country produces 5.4 million metric tons of plastic each year and is the biggest plastic polluter in the Arab world. The construction industry is responsible for around one quarter of Egypt's carbon emissions because it relies heavily on concrete. Worldwide concrete production generates nearly 3 billion tons of CO2 a year. Of course, one school building made of earth and plastic bottles filled with sand won't solve the problem, but it can show what's possible. There's a trend toward reducing plastic usage and finding solutions or non-polluting ways to recycle it. So we thought, why shouldn't we start with a new idea and a prototype to reuse plastic in something that benefits school children and the environment? Meanwhile, the playground is slowly taking shape. There are a few jobs here, so the villagers are happy to have work. Shaban Asha normally gets by doing casual labor. He gets paid 15 euros a day. His son Adam is also helping. I wanted to work here for the sake of the children. I've gathered new ideas too, which I can apply elsewhere. The building work is taking six months. Many of the villagers were involved and filmed the progress. 
The school and playground cost around 10,000 euros to build. The project was funded by UNESCO as a model of how good ideas can help reduce waste. The village's participation in the project was not about saving money, it's an important part of the concept. We want them to appreciate the building so they'll look after it. If they share in the work, they'll feel like it belongs to them. The finishing touches are being applied to the flooring. Even one of the architects is helping. The building is scheduled to open in September 2022 and has space for 35 children to resume the schooling in a pleasant atmosphere. The palm trees in the classroom were allowed to remain and have been incorporated into the design. The roof is made of bamboo, a fast-growing sustainable material. In the evening, the playground is finally ready, the work is over, now it's time to relax and enjoy the results. What a great initiative. Our next piece highlights something our ancestors already knew about and used to successfully defy the hot temperatures in our regions. In this regard, they listened closely to nature and we are way ahead of us as our Doing Your Bit This Week shows. These vegetables aren't even good enough for soup. In sub-Saharan Africa, more than 40% of fruit and vegetables go to waste every year. They often spoil on the way from harvest to market because of a lack of refrigeration. Malawi knows the problem well. Almost 90% of the population has no access to electricity. But since last year, many farmers in Wazika, a village in the south of the country, have been able to use small cooling boxes. They weigh just four kilos and have a 60 litre volume. Developed in the US, the unit is meant to help solve the cooling problem without the need for electricity. This cooler box uses water. On the outside, there are small bags, which we fill with six litres of water. When the water's filled, then I take the vegetables and put them inside. I close the lid and all the vegetables inside are kept as fresh as if I just picked them from the garden. Due to the special materials in the box, heat is extracted from the inside, leaving it more than 10 degrees Celsius cooler than the outside temperature. Fruit and vegetables stay fresh longer and can still be sold for up to five days. Demand is high for the boxes, even though each one costs around 150 US dollars. The World Food Programme has paid for the first boxes. They hope that they can soon be produced much cheaper locally in Malawi. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. And now we go from low tech to high tech. Very high tech indeed in Europe. Over to you, Sandra. Thank you, Chris. Now, while you might think of green energy as sustainable, it also leads to waste. Take giant wind turbines, for example. Europe will have to return nearly 12,000 turbines by 2024. Normally, the old materials would end up in scrapyards, but in Poland, they have found another way to reuse them. These wind turbines are more than 20 years old. Compared to modern ones, they're small and inefficient, so they're being torn down. So what happens to these green energy giants at the end of their lifespan? The blades, especially, are made of composites and plastics. Instead of recycling them, a lot ends up in landfills, or incinerated in the kilns of cement and steel factories. 
For some years now, facilities that incinerate them aren't really happy about it, and that's down to the physics of the combustion process. The glass fiber is bonded with resins, which gum up the kiln and the ash. So quite apart from the environmental lunacy, it's just not an ideal solution. And recycling is only just getting off the ground. It's only recently that wind turbine manufacturers have had the wind-to-waste problem on their radar. That often leads to situations like this. On this green field, decommissioned turbine blades are dismantled for the scrapyard. One company near the Polish city of Wrocław has come up with a solution. Unmet takes old turbine blades from Germany and turns them into furniture. The blades, up to 12 meters long, are first sawed into sections. Sanded and painted, they get a new life as outdoor furniture, chairs, benches, and tables, accented with top quality larch wood. Students from the University of Jelona Gura come up with the designs. They're thrilled that their products are being bought by customers around the world. Of course, you can use it inside, but I think outside is, um, is better right to, to use this material because it's waterproof, it's damage-proof. A footbridge, another of Anmet's novel recycling ideas. The rotor blades were transformed into the support for a pedestrian bridge. It's the brainchild of engineer Andrzej Adamcho. For him, old blades are not hazardous waste, but a resource. For example, we don't try to change the shape of the rotor. We turn it into a sculpture with a dozen blades. It's going to be monumental, really big, so that it will really wow people. Andrzej Schnabel runs an online shop, Wings for Living. That's the exclusive retailer. There's even an app to let you see what the furniture would look like in your garden. Schnabel and his counterparts in Poland are good friends. A garden bench like this can easily cost 1,500 euros. We're aiming to be a small and stylish brand that helps raise awareness of the problem and also shows that old discarded objects can be turned into beautiful and unique furnishings. His friends in Poland are constantly coming up with innovative designs, like a rotor wing transformed into a wine cellar. When it comes to upcycling, the sky's the limit. And there's no shortage of turbine blades that need repurposing. The new generation of wind turbines are bigger and more powerful. Modern turbines are temples of high-tech, filled to the brim with electronic components. And they promise to help solve the wind-to-waste problem. In 30 or 40 years, when these turbines go offline, they'll be more easily recycled into valuable raw materials. Alle all big manufacturers are working on producing their components so that they'll be easier to recycle, meaning in a way that's environmentally sustainable, energy-saving and cost-saving. 100% recyclable turbine blades are the wave of the future. Germany, for example, plans to install 1,500 new wind turbines a year. In a few decades, their aging blades will be mined for valuable raw materials. Even if the food situation in Germany is relatively stable, it doesn't mean that everything is fine. The area set aside for cultivation is limited. Farms compete with other infrastructure projects such as roads or wind turbines. Now, like everywhere in the world, the climate crisis is making the situation worse. Additionally, there are consumers who are calling for a general rethink of agriculture. This is why two of them wanted to take a closer look at the farm of Willem Eke. An early morning wash at Eckai Farm in the Sauerland region of western Germany. Today, Wilhelm Eckai doesn't have to look after his animals alone. 
Alexandra Mustapic and Inez Koenig are here to help for a weekend. They've only just arrived but are already hard at work. They want to learn more about the practical challenges faced by farmers. I work in the food industry and would like to continue down this path in the future. And I wanted to get to know the whole food industry from its roots. I'm self-employed in the catering industry and I work with products from the food industry. I wanted to know where they're made, where they come from and how much work actually goes into them. The farm has been in the family for 150 years. It covers 70 hectares of land and has pigs, cows and chickens. While not an organic farm, Wilhelm Eckei is big on sustainable methods and animal welfare. Unlike on many farms, the pigs can move freely in their stall and an outdoor area. But of course, the animals will still be slaughtered. I'm not the kind of person who says that I can't eat them now that I see them. It's actually just the opposite once you see they have a good life. There's always lots to do. Raising livestock is an important part of the farm's income. In addition to around 300 pigs, there are also 40 cows. But the farmer has no plans to increase his livestock. There werden zu viele Schweine und Geflügel gehalten. In Germany, we keep too many pigs and poultry. We produce more meat than we can consume, and that's not good for anyone. We have to import feed. We have to export the meat. It's a difficult market, too, so that farmers often don't earn enough income. Plus, we then have the problem of manure which is simply no longer a valuable nutrient when there's so much of it, and instead it becomes problematic for the groundwater. So he decided to take a different path. In 1989, Wilhelm Eckei's farm was the first in Germany to adopt stricter animal welfare rules. These include free roaming for livestock all year round, the use of straw, and plenty of space in the stalls, unlike industrial agriculture. We have to move towards more regional farming and regional marketing, where we produce for the needs of our population and under conditions that are approved, ecological and sustainable. The work continues for the two women. Next, they have to collect eggs from the chicken coop. The farm has more than 1,200 hens. I've never collected eggs like this. Oh, it's warm. It's really fresh. Is it farming that needs to change or something else? I think the problem is overconsumption, the constant unnecessary demand from consumers. If we could just reduce that, then there'd be no problem. Then people would just be satisfied with what's available. So both consumers and farmers need to change. But how much change is realistic? The two women raised the issue during the coffee break. Not to completely turn back the clock, but people joining forces to work together again. A sharing system. Exactly. You can think of all sorts of things, including new farms, small farms that are managed sensibly by several generations, or a farm with a baker, a butcher or handicraft business. In our market economy, the decisive factor is always whether something's profitable, whether the prospects for making money are so good that there are courageous people who'll do it. Wilhelm Eckei has that courage and has invested in new mobile outbuildings for his chickens. We're actually getting three of these in total. They cost a lot of money, so of course it's not something you do when you're 60, but our son said he's more interested in poultry. So the future of the farm is looking secure, and the sustainability concept of the past 30 years is set to continue. The working day has finished for the women. What's their main takeaway?
Farms need to be smaller instead of being huge outfits. I see that as a better way of producing food. Yes, create an awareness in each individual so they're willing to pay certain prices because they know where the food comes from and so they appreciate it in a completely different way. We simply produce and throw away too much food. And what the two of them also found out, how much hard work actually goes into making a single breakfast egg. Less can indeed be more. We have seen this many times in the fight against climate change. Sticking with farming, we head over to Burkina Faso, a country in Western Africa, where more than 80% of the population lives from and with agriculture. They have to deal with heat, drought and lack of rain just to secure any harvest at all. So through Sandra, to cope with these difficult conditions, What's needed is more knowledge and better management of their land. Luckily, there is a project that uses unusual means to pass that knowledge on to farmers. At first glance, Bama is a village like many others in Burkina Faso. But it's also part of an ambitious pilot project aimed at bringing helpful information to the country's rural regions. Here, smallholder farmers can use their phones to access radio programs that feature agricultural information in four local languages called Transmission Air et Terre. The program airs practical ideas and suggestions to listeners. Thanks to this radio show, I learned how to utilize fertilizer pellets better. We found out about the Pocket FM channel and learned how it works. We really appreciate it. And the best thing is that with just a few clicks, you can call up and listen to older programs. That is a great feature. The technology behind it is simple. Farmers can call up programs free of charge via portable radio transmitters. It doesn't use up data volume or require a SIM card. All that's necessary is to be within a specific six kilometer range. The radio station Bama Pele, one of the project partners can be listened to in the middle of rice fields. Some of the programs can be accessed later on demand by people unable to listen to live broadcasts or by those who don't have radios. Time behind the microphone is given to farmers, but also to agricultural experts. We talked about preparing the soil for planting and also about the distances that farmers should leave between the waterways and their fields. We also discussed the use of pesticides and their effects on the soil and the negative impact on plants. The project is not a one-way street. The producers regularly meet with farmers' representatives to find out which topics are of interest to them. These farmers will welcome programs about seed or fertilizers that bring higher yields, but also protect the soil. Those who've heard about new and interesting innovations tell us about them. They're also in contact with specialists from various fields. They very often suggest we talk to people who have special expertise on certain topics. So, the group here in Bama has a major influence on our program. The devices come from a project partner in Germany and are financed by the German development agency, GIZ. The program targets regions with poor or no radio reception. We piloted Pocket FM in Bondukwe, Bama, Diebugu, and in the Cascades region. It was so successful that we want to introduce Pocket FM in the rest of Burkina Faso in the coming weeks and months. In the future, video clips should also be available, even without an internet connection. The team is currently shooting one about vegetable diseases and how to treat them. But regardless of how multimedia it becomes, Pocket FM will continue to report those issues and need nearest and dearest to the farmers. 
just like it has always been. What a wonderful project. Take a closer look at it again on our website or social media. Maybe it's something that would work in your community. Well, that's it for this edition of Echo Africa. I'm Chris Alem saying goodbye from Abelkuta, Nigeria. Bye, Chris. I'll be seeing you again next week. And to you, our viewers, please do stay in touch. Follow us on all our social media platforms. We are always looking forward to hearing from you. I am Sandra Twinovidio, signing off from Kampala here in Uganda. <laughs>